ladies and gentlemen, we would like to introduce NFC's lead matchmaker and the man who is on the banner for this Friday, Jesse Wable's Amateur Series. That's Jesse Wable. Jesse, how you feel, man? Good. How y'all doing? No complaints. No complaints. Good to see you, man. It's fight week. Um, big fight coming up. How is the preparation on your end? What does that look like? Yeah, man. Finally, fight week. I'm excited. Um, just basically making sure, you know, everybody has their medicals in. I think we've only got like three or four fighters left that haven't turned in their blood. That's always a big concern for me on fight weeks is uh, making sure that the fighters all, you know, have their medicals in and everything they need that's required to fight. Um hoping that I don't have to give anybody bad news. You know what I mean? That's definitely like the worst part of the job is uh, when people don't have their medicals in or get injured last minute, uh, telling people that their fight's off, you know, on short notice. That's, you know, that's the crappy part of the job. But luckily, we haven't had any of that so far. Everybody's on track. It seems like everybody's close to wait. And uh, just a few people waiting on medicals, and that's it. Uh, we'll be heading down tomorrow. Me and Charlene are going to go down solo. Without Dave this time, we're going to set up the cage and show him we can do it. Uh, without his help, we're going to go down there tomorrow night at Tannery Row and set up the cage and start getting everything ready. And, uh, yeah, just excited for Friday. Dave mentioned it a little earlier, you know, that, that he's not helping set up the cage. But what's the biggest difference between you working um, uh, NFC 150 versus a Jesse Wables Amateur Series 151? I get to see a lot more like behind the scenes stuff, you know, um, obviously I get to see a lot of the ticket sales, who's buying tickets, who's selling what, um, just getting to learn a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, the cost of the event, um, how much it costs to do a show, um, you know, renting chairs, paying people, paying, you know, yourself, generally everybody that's on the, you know, on the NFC roster that gets paid. Um, just really seeing how everything works, you know, for years, I just matched fights for Dave and, and that was it. And I just, you know, got a check, and that was really my only responsibility. But I think he wanted me to kind of start, you know, moving on up and learning a little more. And, you know, we had a meeting um, maybe about a year and a half ago with Charlene at the Mall of Georgia and just talked about everything and talked about learning um, the process better. And, and I'm definitely learning a lot. Did you hear us when we were talking about that meeting? Were you listening earlier? I didn't. I was trying to get signed in. I was having some phone issues. I think it was December 31st, 2019. Was it then or December 31st, 2020? Maybe 2020. Maybe 2020. Okay. David, now sitting here listening to you talk to, to, to Jesse, it just, it seems it, to me, it seems like you're the, you're the mentor kind of giving the mentee an opportunity to learn the business. So maybe one day you can transition to the, to, to the, your next phase. And Jesse could, you know, maybe I'm not signing anybody up for retirement. I know you're completely <laughs> I just got far fired. away from that. But was that kind of the mindset of like, hey, like, I have a lot of knowledge. Let me just pass this knowledge down. I don't know. I, I always say I hate the term promoter. I think promoter is the cheesiest term in the world. I just go with small business owner. And I think I've said that on here before. So I think it's just a small business owner or company trying to push people higher up in the company, give them more responsibility, find out a way to pay them better. Um, and, and I've said before, I'm going to die. I'm probably going to die pretty soon. Who knows? Um, but this way NFC can go on. I'm knocking on know, wood past this. Um, so I don't know. It was just a way to vary it up, a way to get more shows, a way to expand the company, reward Jesse and Charlene and, uh, you know, just think of other ideas and go with it. Um, and, and one big thing that I liked is, you know, he kind of gave me and Charlene, you know, creative control. Wherever you guys want to hold a fight, you can do it. If you want to do it here, if you want to do it in South Carolina, if you want to do it in North Carolina, Alabama, wherever y'all want. Um, but, you know, me and Charlene are, you know, more North Georgia a little bit. Uh, and I'm lucky, man. Uh, this venue is probably eight minutes from my house. Normally I'm driving like an hour uh, both ways, you know, to get the district and Monday Night Brewing and all that. So this venue is right next to my house in Buford. Uh, so I was really, really happy about that. I was glad he let us do it too on Buford. And to answer your question, Sean Corning, um, we do have enough people to put together the cage. I didn't want to ask you because I know you're all the way out in Conyers or something like that. So we don't need you tomorrow, but we do need you Friday to do the gloves and uh, take down the cage and learn how to do that again. So uh, I was going to message you today. Shout out to everybody that's uh, listening on YouTube, Facebook. Y'all continue to drop those comments in our comment section. 
We appreciate that feedback. Again, this is NFC Now, joined with Jesse Wable ahead of Jesse Wable's Amateur Series 4 at Tannery Road this Friday, November 4th. Doors at 6, fights at 7. You just talked about the location of it being in Tannery Row and you and Charlene being based more in North Georgia. I want to talk about the market there. Like, you know, you're saying you're seeing a little bit behind the scenes. What does that North Georgia mar mixed martial arts market look like? I think we have a lot of good, solid gyms around here, around this area in Buford, like Hall County, Gwinnett County. Uh, you know, we have Full Throttle Fitness with Kelly Leo, American Top Team, uh, Team Lima, which of course has a lot of fighters. Gwinnett Training Academy with Amir Dadovich and O.C. Abuna, SBG Buford, of course. Um, there's a lot of good gyms around here. And, um, you know, I guess it's about the same distance between maybe most of them in Atlanta. But like I said, for me, just have, being able to do a poster where I live, it, it, just, it was awesome. Now, we have 14 fights on this card coming up, man. Uh, I see a, a, a 11 or 10 mixed martial arts fights, one professional mixed martial arts fight. Got three Muay Thai fights and one jiu-jitsu card. Why did you match it like this? And um, what are you looking forward to most on this card? Yeah, so this is the first time we put a jiu-jitsu match on uh, one of my cards. I uh, just wanted to kind of mix things up, uh, do things a little different. We got a guy from SVG Buford, uh, Sean Valentine. He actually submitted Mad Mike Wilson. Uh, so Sean Valentine is a purple belt and submitted Mad Mike Wilson, who's a brown belt with a no-arm triangle choke. Uh, for B2 fighting series. So that was super impressive. I wanted to see him back. Uh, and he's going against a tough pro fighter, Austin Childers. So that's definitely one I'm looking forward to. We haven't had a jiu-jitsu match at Tannery Row. I'm curious to see how that plays over with the crowd. Um, but yeah, we've got, you know, a mix. We've got Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, amateur MMA, and of course the one pro MMA fight between Josh Kozer and Walter Flores. Um, looking forward to, you know, just mixing it up, a good variety of fights and uh, jiu-jitsu action. Now, you mentioned Josh Kozier. One of my questions that I had to ask you, man, is, you know, we had him on last week as well as you, man. What are your emotions when you watch Josh fight? It's rough, man. So, like, it's fight week for me. So, I'm already nervous about, like I said, about fights. Um, you know, hoping that everybody's on track. Like I said, it's my biggest, like, fear is fight week. Like, all right, we're at 14 fights right now. Please, let's keep it at 14, you know, by Thursday at Wayne's. And then even at Wayne's, we lose fights. So, you know, that's always rough. But, yeah, and then the added pressure on top of that of, you know, Kozer being my boy, whatever. Uh, yeah, it, it's nerve-wracking. I get nervous. I get more nervous watching him fight than I ever did fighting or any, watching anybody else fight. So, yeah, that's definitely rough. But, you know, it is what it is. It's what we signed up for. And I haven't asked you about it yet. I figured I'd wait till tonight. But uh, Kozer versus Walter, that moved up, what, five pounds, seven pounds or something like that? Yeah, seven moved pounds. From 140 to 145 plus two, so it moved up seven pounds. Yeah, so we do seven-day-out weight checks before every fight. The commission made us start doing that about a year ago. Um, the limit for them, it was at 138 plus two, so that's 100 pounds. They weren't supposed to weigh it over 154, seven days out. Yeah. Um, Josh was 154.8. So he was 0.8 over and Walter was 158. So he was yeah. four pounds over. So looking at it a week out, um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, both were healthy. Neither, you know, had a real bad weight cut, got super depleted. Uh, it is one of the higher ticket selling fights on the card. Uh, so we just decided, you know, we talked to Josh and Walter. We made sure that uh, Walter was okay moving the fight up. They didn't have a problem. Uh, they actually wanted the fight at 145 to begin with. I think it was uh, SBG's idea to kind of have it at, 140 catchway because they want uh Kozer at 135 as a pro but like i said with it being short notice a couple of days out we just decided to go ahead and move it up just to be safe dave has been breaking a whole lot of news on today's show man i love it i love it thank you for giving us that insight i think we need to do a podcast after the weigh-ins i'm telling you people are going to miss weight this thursday it's right. halloween was last night the guys are still eating candy this week. They're going to yell at us at weigh in to go, man, your scale is broken. I was on weight on my scale. We're, I'm, I'm <laughs> predicting four people miss weight. I'm not we saying should do a live, we should do a live podcast at the weigh in and have everybody that missed weight pop on with Julian and Dave. <laughs> and I'm asking them the tough questions. And you know, Dave don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> 
Don't <laughs> give a damn, Dave. That's, That's what it is. That's my predictions. My predictions are four guys miss weight this Friday, this Thursday. Yeah. On average, how many people normally miss weight? I'd guess about three people probably. I mean, like two to three. Like you'll have two to three amateurs miss it by half a pound or a pound. Some of their opponents are dicks and want to make them cut weight, which, you know, I think it's good or bad. If the guy's about to die, you might lose your amateur fight if the guy passes out or this or that. So you're kind of putting your fight at risk. I get it, though. Um, but we usually have about three guys miss weight. One of them were miss weight by a lot, and the other two by about a half a pound. So. I, I think our average is three, but that's going to go up this Thursday. I will say I always made people uh, go run, cut the weight. And uh, I think one time I got an extra 50 bucks on one pro fight because the guy missed weight, so that was cool. <laughs> Shout out to that. Now, we have, again, 14 fights on the card this coming Friday night. Doors at six, fights at seven. Sleeper fights, man. What are some fights that aren't towards the top of the card that we should be looking for? forward to jesse wabel i'm excited about nathan rivera versus christian harden uh, we haven't put a whole lot of uh promotion or attention on that fight but man that's gonna be a fight uh nathan rivera cracks on the feet that dude hits hard um just he that, that he's a hard hitter every time you see him fight he's cracking people and he's fighting christian harden who also trains out of contemporary martial uh not also but trains out of contemporary martial arts under chuck coffin Anytime you got CMA versus ATT, you know you're in for, for a good fight. Um, one that I'm also excited about, you guys are having Xavier Horton on the podcast later, which is cool. And just a side note, I never really know who's coming on the podcast. So, like, Monday, when I see the poster, it's always, my like, hell yeah. So, I saw Xavier Horton was coming on, so that's cool. I haven't, I know Xavier a little bit. I haven't got to talk to him much. But, man, that dude is uh, powerhouse. I think he's got like three percent body fat on him. For I think um, I what I saw is four. I saw four. four I don't five, mean to cheat him out of like percent, that. but yeah, dude, that guy is he's an animal, and he's fighting Elijah Morin, who's uh, out of American Top Team Team Lima. So yeah, definitely excited about that one too. Yeah, I, I'm super excited about that fight, man. I can't even lie. That Adele Gladney one versus uh, Travell Miller, man. I don't. I'm just here for Travell's walkout. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. You know he always brings a party to Tannery Row, man. You did mention Nathan Rivera. I know Nathan Rivera has been, you know, kind of going through it. You know, he lost him, um, to Josh the Dozier Kozier in that title fight, that short notice title fight, and then he lost again in a kickboxing match. Yeah. I'm really excited to see him back, you know? Yeah, I mean, both of the guys he fought were stud. You know, Josh, of course, is good. And the guy he fought in kickboxing, Carrington Johnson, me and David actually just saw a fight in the main event this past weekend in Chattanooga, Carrington Johnson. So it's like, you know, Eli, he didn't lose to anybody that wasn't good or, you know, reputable. He fought studs. And uh, I like Nathan, man. I really, really like that kid a lot. Uh, we're friendly with each other. Me and him are cool. Like I said, I love watching him fight. He brings a, you know, a good energy in there. He, he throws hard. He comes to finish the fight. He's not in there just to you know, patty kick around. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that one. Nathan's a cool guy. I like Nathan, too. I got to say that. David? I was going to say, I think he used to be at X3 Sports, right? Yeah, he, I, was I think... at, he was at a smaller gym. I can't remember it off the top of my head. He was at a smaller gym uh, for a while and then moved to X3, and now he's yeah. at MTT. And, and the weird thing is he wasn't even with the other X3 guys, uh, Robert and Nathan, those other guys in Midtown. He was at X3 in Marietta or North Johnny Marietta. Dunn. Yeah, so from going from North Marietta, and, and I haven't asked him if he moved yet, but to go from North Marietta all the way now to Duluth, Georgia, for your gym, I don't know if he's driving an hour and a half each way or if he moved up there, so – yeah, and I know I see him doing a lot of uh, going to Brantley Fur's house a lot on the side, yeah. doing pad work, which I can't wait for y'all to get Brantley Fur on the podcast. But he's yeah, going to uh, Brantley Fur's house a lot on the side, like doing pad work, and he's really uh, putting in work. I'm telling you, I've been on Brantley Fur about getting him on this show, man. I've been on Brantley Fur because I see him all the time, and I, I, I respect Brantley Fur. And, like, you know, just going to these gyms and talking to every fighter and seeing Brantley in all these corners – Everybody has the utmost respect for Brantley. Before yeah, we get man. before we get Chris Wynn on, the champ, the flyweight champ, to talk about this fight. One, I want to know, are you able to stay on any further to talk talk a little more to some of these some of these guys that are competing on your card? Uh, man, I'm probably gonna have to get off here in a second. I gotta I gotta get down to get the little ones ready. Completely understand. Completely understand. We yeah, just I apologize. Had to ask. I apologize. I, no, no, no. Thank you for just your time right now. We gotta know your thoughts about the Jake Paul Anderson Silva fight. 
Fixed. Fixed. Rigged. Bullshit. Okay, tell me why. Man, that was a sparring match. Anderson Silva was just literally sparring him. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, even my favorite podcaster, Brendan Schaub, was saying, if you guys think that that was fixed, you're, you're, you know, you're crazy. I got to disagree. I just, I mean, it didn't look like he was trying. Uh, one good point that was brought up today by actually my supervisor at work. You know, if there's something in the contracts, you know, that says like, you know, uh, Anderson Silva maybe can't knock him out or they're, I don't know. But then I was thinking Jake Paul fought Ben Askren in Atlanta. So if there was something in that contract, would Matt Woodruff have seen that? That's just a random question. There would be, but I don't think they put that in contracts. I think that's a backroom discussion. I think everyone leaves their cell phones in a different room. They get felt up to make sure they're not microphone like old school mafia. And they go in the other room and say, hey, look, Anderson, if you lose to our guy and you make it look difficult so we can say it was a real fight, you've got a briefcase waiting for you over there for $250,000. If you are, if you knock our guy out, you're never going to be booked on another Jake Paul show, never going to be booked on another MVP show, and you're not getting that briefcase with a quarter million dollars. I think those are the discussions that go on behind the scenes with absolutely nothing in print. But I don't think Anderson Silver tried in that fight. I think he tried to make it competitive. He rope doped around. He ran in circles. He hit him a couple times, but he never went for the knockout punch. He never went for the killer instinct. He, he, he looked like a guy that just started boxing a year ago, not a guy that's been fighting MMA with the style of boxing for probably 25 years. Yeah, and we David, know he's got the been... power with the boxing gloves on, too. He just knocked out Tito Ortiz like a year ago, went the distance with Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. I mean, it's just not that fight was big. Yeah. David, have you ever been privy to some of those conversations where in the back room where there's no, no cell phones, no anything? Not one of those. I mean, I don't think that's one I want to be involved in. Um, I think once you're involved in those, your career goes downhill. Um, you know, fight fixing or any sports fixing is about the worst thing you can do in the world. And I think we've all seen it in movies or shows or read books. I mean, if you're looking to fix a football game, you got to convince out of 11 starters quite a few of them. If you're looking to convince a, fix a basketball game, you've only got to get to one kid on the team. If you're looking to fix a fight, there's only two people. If you can get to one of them, your job's done. It's the easiest sport in the world to fix. I personally think that was a fixed fight. And I think when we when I did the poll on the NFC community, I think it stayed at around 75% thought it was a fixed fight. You know what? Maybe I'm a novice. There was no point in that fight where I thought that it was a fixed fight. I My overall takeaway from that is that I respect Jake Paul for just building himself to a person that we're talking about on a Tuesday night and that we're, we're watching, we're going somewhere. Like I knew I wanted to go well watch that fight. And yeah, we'll I, I just respect Jake. that. I respect we'll see how he Jake does against Nate Diaz. What's that? I so said, we'll see how he does against Nate Diaz. Yeah. I don't think Nate Diaz can be bought, but I think that's also the end of the line for Jake Paul. I think they knew you can lose money on three or four fights and that is the ultimate payday. If you're going to lose a fight, you can lose a Nate Diaz because it's a 50, it's probably an 80% chance his career ends with the Nate Diaz fight. That is the golden nugget that they were trying to get to. So do you really think that, that Anderson Silva would, would, would get a payoff like that? You think, you think, you think Anderson Silva would agree to that? I, would. I know that going out on Anderson Silva was like, uh, like his last couple fights in the UFC, him and Dana White and the promotion weren't really that cool. There was a little bit of beef going on. So it, it wouldn't surprise me, man, to see him just be like, look, I'm going to come collect the check and then I'm going to help you kind of, because they did make a bet that now they have to kind of co-align and go against the UFC and do a fighter's union or whatever. So why not get a payday and then help go against the people that were pissing you off? I like the idea of the fighters, uh, the, the United Fighters Collective, is that what they call it? I couldn't tell you the exact yeah. uh, word for it. I don't think it'll work. I mean, it's a cool idea. I just never think. Yeah. It'll work. <laughs> before again, before we get Christopher Wynn on, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to NFC Now. That's Jesse Wable. I'm David Oblas. Jesse Wable's amateur series four is taking place this Friday, November fourth, at Tannery Road. Doors at six. Fights at seven. This is the final opportunity for fighters to make their claim for our end of the year awards. Have y'all been kind of thinking about some of these fight of the year candidates, knockout of the year candidates, candidates, submission of the year candidates, coach of the year candidates? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
this, like I said, this Friday will be the last card of the year. Um, so for the people that do want those awards, come out and show out Friday. Go out there, you know, do your best. Try to get the knockout. Try to get, get the submission. Fight hard. And uh, try to get yourself one of those awards. I agree. I was going to put a poll up on NFC and start seeing what people think about it with a month out, but I figured I'd actually wait till after this weekend's over because it's always unique. I say it every year. We always have the last card of the fight, fight last card of the year and the first card of the year. So next show will be January 20th at Monday Night Brewing. That's the first show in the state of Georgia in 2023. Um, so this year, as always, we have the last MMA show and the first one of the next year. I'm um, still waiting to figure out which Saturday in January will work for the banquet. Uh, might even figure out other cool, unique things to do around it. Maybe a show. Uh, I don't know. We're going to do something cool for the banquet next year, though. Jesse Wable, final thoughts? And I'm just pumped. Like I said, pumped, nervous, excited. Uh, all the emotions going through me right now. Uh, Friday is going to be fun. Uh, like I said, excited to get out there tomorrow and help you know, start setting everything up. And, you know, a couple more days and we'll be there. Again, ladies and gentlemen, that is Jesse Wable ahead of Jesse Wable's Amateur Series for this Friday, November 4th at Tannery Road Doors at 6, fights at 7. Headline by Christopher Wynn and Abraham Perez as they fight yeah. for the NFC's Flyweight Championship title. Jesse, as always, thank you for your time. Shouts out to your beautiful kids and wife. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you on Friday. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a good night. Indeed.